Greetings from East Baptist Church situated on the North Shore of Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, my name's Kevin Adams. I came out here uh, 16 years ago uh, to speak about the Welsh Revival and ended up moving here. And I moved here because of my love for church history. I love church history so much, Welsh church history, I even married a professor of church history and came over to live here uh, in uh, 2004. Today we're going to take a look at Christianity in Wales. We're going to take a basic overview, very, very basic in these 25 uh, minutes, but we're going to concentrate on how we should use that overview, how we should use church history to give us hope today. We don't want to stay in the past, we want to live for today. So let's start. By the second half of the 19th century, Wales was regarded as a Christian country. If you lived in Wales, if you were a Welsh speaker especially, you went to Sunday school. Uh, and Sunday school wasn't just for uh, children, it was for adults as well, which meant increasingly a literate, knowledgeable, working class. Wales was full of churches and chapels of all sorts of denominations. And, and these were central to the culture of the day. There were preaching festivals, there were singing festivals. Uh, people's lives were right around the church. The church was central. And as I said, many people now regarded it as a Christian country. The minister was in his heyday. The minister, the great chapel minister with his ability to preach, was regarded as a sort of demigod, if you like. And um, in, in the uh, Welsh Encyclopedia Britannica, it's not actually the Encyclopedia Britannica, it's the Gwyddion Adir, okay, 13 volumes. I have a set, I brought them over uh, with me. It's amazing because what you have is articles on key historical figures or key biblical figures like Jeremiah, David, Napoleon, uh, Joan of Arc or whatever. But also right next to these articles, you have articles on, on Welsh ministers who are hardly known, but they were regarded so high that they were, were included, as it were, as key people in the history of the nation of Wales. Christianity landed here round about the beginning of the second century. The early church father, Tertullian, tells us that Christianity probably came to Wales at the end of the second century. Uh, Gwyn Davies, uh, in his book uh, uh, on the history of Christianity in Wales, said that Christianity tiptoed into Wales. Then we look, uh, as time goes on, into something which historians have called the Age of the Saints. Now, once again, it's worth saying that we're, there's a lot of history we don't know here. Lots of the uh, lives of the saints were written not at the time. There were one or two, like the uh, life of St. Samson of Dole. Uh, but most of them were written much, uh, much later uh, in, in early medieval times. And they're incredibly mythological. We don't know that much. But what we do know is this, that a foundation was laid for Christianity. And that these people made a huge impression. They were far more monastic, building churches all over. Uh, I, I used to live in a place called Llan Ethli, and Llan Ethli means the Church of Ethli. And throughout the land, there are Llans and uh, all sorts of things, reminding us with the Celtic uh, crosses of a movement that in many ways has been lost to history. Then, of course, we come to medieval times. And Really, that's a holding on to things. Uh, you, get, you get a number of interesting things. You get church buildings with the coming of the Normans. They put everything into parishes, and there are church buildings going up all over Wales, many of which have survived 
all these years. Can you imagine having a place of prayer for 1,000 years? It's quite incredible. After that comes the Protestant Reformation. Now, the Protestant Reformation in Wales isn't like the Protestant Reformation in Britain or in Germany. Really, the Welsh weren't interested in having a Reformation. They, they weren't interested. And as a, as a public, uh, as a public uh, revival, you can't say that that was the case. Yet, foundations are being built. And this is especially true with the translation of the Bible in 1588 into Welsh. The, the, the New Testament was translated by Salisbury in the 1560s. So suddenly, the Welsh language written is tied to the Bible. And before long, it's going to be part of the DNA of the Welsh people. As you move on, of course, uh, from the Reformation, you get the Puritan period with some key preachers and teachers like Walter Craddock and Urbury and the mystic uh, Morgan Lloyd. We haven't got time to look at them. And then you come to the 18th century, which is the beginning of modern Wales. And this is where we begin to speak, of course, of the fathers of Methodism. William Williams, Pantacalian, the great hymnist who wrote, Died me, O thou great Jehovah. The preacher, Daniel Rowland, regarded in his day as probably the greatest of preachers. And that very interesting character, Howell Harris, who was determined to plant societies and churches throughout the land. That moves on, of course, then into the 19th century with the Methodist revival um, really settling down and churches being built, organisations uh, being uh, put together. And by the end of the 19th century, with a number of revivals, quite a number of them, the greatest being the 1859 revival, you can go back to the 1816 Beth Gellert revival, Christianity, by now, has strong foundations in Wales. But it's non-conformist Christianity, mainly, that has uh, that, uh, that strength. Then you come to uh, uh, 1904 and the revival we all know about and uh, we speak about with Evan Roberts and all the different things that happened there. And we could move on into the 20th century and I'll make reference to that later on. The history of Christianity in Wales is utterly fascinating. It's worth a read. I do not have the time in these minutes to expand in detail, but rather I want to look at some ways now that we can get hope and inspiration from our own study of that period. I want to begin by saying we can make mistakes in the way we look at Christianity. And I want to know two of them. The first one is a tendency to want to reenact our favourite period. Now, I've studied church history for the last uh, 45 years or so, and I've loved it. And I've had crazes on different periods, I must admit. A craze on the early church, uh, uh, looked into the mystics, uh, medieval mystics, and then it was the 19th century, then the 18th century, and we could all go on. And all of us have our favourite periods. The danger, of course, with this is that we want to reenact those periods in our period. And that leads often to great disappointment. It fights against hope. You see, time and time again, people have, uh, people have talked about all we need to get back to. And uh, they want to see that period reproduced. Now, there's a lot of reenactment here in New England, by the way. Um, Jess and our south. Uh, there is the Plymouth Plantation. And if you go to the Plymouth Plantation, that's where the Mayflower landed, uh, you will see reenactors. 
and they're all dressed in uh, period costume. They even speak to you uh, in period English and they refuse even to admit that there are any years after 1640 or something like that. Um, it's, it's fascinating and great. It's wonderful. You get an experience. But we are not called to reenact another century. I'm sure you've heard people say, what we need is to get back to the early church. That's what we need. I often uh, respond and say, uh, what part of the early church? Do you want to get back to Corinth? Do you want to get back to, you know, wherever? We are not called to reproduce in that sense. Things are different. There is a, there is a, a feeling, I think, in Wales that the answer to everything is just revival. Well, if a revival comes, we'll just preach, uh, we'll just pray, and revival will come. And that will be the answer. Everything will sort itself out with revival. We can have 1904 again, or we could have 1816 again, or 1762 again. The chapels will be full, and, and there, there'll be a sort of magic. I call it magic. The magic revival that will come and change everything. And do you know what happens? People have been talking about this for years and years and years, and it hasn't happened in that way. And as a result, hope deferred maketh the heart sick, said the King James Version in, in a proverb. And people get tired of waiting for something that doesn't appear because they're waiting for something that's not going to come in that same way. For instance, people say, if only we could have 1904 again. Now, let me say, I've, I've written two books on 1904 and, and a documentary. I'm not against 1904. I spent years of my life looking at it. And may God bless us again with revival. But what I'm saying is the situation of 1904 was totally different to the situation of 2020. The chapels were full in Wales. God revived the chapels. It wasn't a secular society like we live today. And if we just want to reproduce what happened in the past, we are not going to get anywhere with it. We need to apply some of the lessons to our present, not to reinvent our past. The second one is somewhat uh, similar. And uh, it's similar because, um, again, we're looking back to the past. And what I'm going to say is this. There is no golden age of the church. I noted just now that people ask about, um, about the early church and they say, well, the thing is, let's get back to the early church. That will sort it all out. Well, the reality is I don't want to get back to the early church. I don't want to get back to uh, the church at Corinth. There's too much hassle there. I don't want to get back to the church in Galatia either. I don't want to get back to lots of the churches, the same churches of Revelation. I'm not that interested in getting back to them. But there's this idea of the past as some, something sacred and wonderful. If only we could get into H.G. Wells' time machine and see it, it would all be wonderful. That is not the case. It's not the case. I've been reading one of the things I'd love to read uh, and I've collected them for, for the last 40 years, is uh, Kovianai, and that's the Welsh for uh, biographies, uh, biographies of mainly uh, Welsh uh, pastors of the 19th century. I have a large collection. I love reading them. It reminds me of Wales. I read them on a regular basis. And time and time again, as I read these biographies, and as I read even during revival times, especially if they're diary form, what you read is they go through hard times in the midst of revival. It, revival doesn't sort everything out. It's not the golden age. And we need uh, to be much more realistic about church history. So, firstly, let's not make those mistakes. Let's not build uh, our dreams on something that is not going to happen in that way. But let's live in the present and let's build on the foundation that church history can give us. So, what, what can we do? 
One of the things I think that's important is that we widen, if you like, our concept of revival. Because when we're thinking about hope, generally for the Welsh person, the whole word and concept of revival comes in. And by now I'm convinced that we need as church to look at other words that signify what God is doing amongst us. You may say, well, that's just words. Well, no, it isn't. For instance, I like to use the word revitalize. I've used other words such as refreshment, growth. All these things are good things that we can be open to right now. I'm sometimes worried that we have a sort of waiting for God or experience, as uh, Samuel Beckett once put it in his play. We're waiting for God or when God or never comes. Because we're not, we, we think he's going to come in a certain way. Where sometimes he is at work amongst us. The whole concept of refreshment and revival uh, comes together, I think, sometimes in, in, in a book like this, Diwigiadau Crefyddol Cymru, uh, Henry Hughes, uh, written, by the way, at the outbreak of the Welsh Revival of 1904. It's quite fascinating. He'd been writing it uh, previous to that. And in it, he talks really about the history of Christianity in Wales. And he uses the word revival all the way through. Because in Welsh, the word for revival is adviwiad. And he uses that for reformation. He uses it for revival. The point I'm trying to make is God can be at work in lots of different ways and we, we mustn't, we mustn't ignore how he has worked amongst us uh, in the past. We mustn't put it to one side. Let me give you one example from my own experience. In the 1970s uh, a number of you might have been present. A number of us uh, in, 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 in Llanelli uh, in, in the valleys as well, were experiencing God working, bringing people to faith. It was happening in the universities now, but it's with, uh, in Bangor as well, amongst the Welsh speakers. Lots of people would be, were coming to faith. And those people have moved on into leadership at this time. Nobody declared a revival. But God was reviving. God was saving. God was growing his church. And I love to look back at that and say, I was back there and I was refreshed. I was refreshed and so were some of you. But we never called it a revival. Another point I want to make here as we're coming to a conclusion, if you like, about uh, getting hope from church history is the whole area of standing on other people's shoulders. Instead of trying to get back into their world, we recognise what they, what they have done, and then we stand on their shoulders. They have built a foundation. Now, the, the main foundation is Jesus Christ himself and the foundation of the teaching of the apostles and prophets. Of course, that is the case. But Individual foundations are built in nations as well. And sometimes we don't need to rebuild what other people have built, but we can build on that. It might look a little different, but we're using, using what those people have done. Let me take a short reading uh, from 1 Corinthians 3. What after all is Apollos and what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. In other words, we all have something to do and we can build on what others have done. I talked about the Welsh Reformation, which didn't really happen in any big way. Um, people weren't really interested in what was going on. They, they, they saw some things happening which were going to make a difference. It was the end of the monastic movement. The monasteries were closed in 1538 and 1540. 
suddenly there was a different church. They would go to church and it would be different. Things were being swept aside. The idols were being pushed out and new things were coming instead. You know, we have the, um, uh, the new prayer book in Welsh uh, in 1567. Uh, by William Salesbury and and he brings out the new uh, prayer book and suddenly that they're not using it that much to begin with people aren't that interested but in years to come there's going to be a change one would build on another and of course in 1588 William Morgan brings out the Welsh Bible the uh, English Bible had become popular of course with with this the Geneva Bible uh, of 1560 but then in 1588, William Morgan, the year of the Spanish Armada, brings out the Bible. And in that Bible, that is going to be a foundation, not just for the Welsh language, which it was, but for spirituality moving on for that. Nobody, I've never heard anyone saying the revival that William Morgan went through. But he built something that we too can stand on. And I think that is so, so important. Peter Williams, in his, uh, in his, uh, uh, his Bible, uh, came out in uh, 1770, and it's the first study Bible in the Welsh language. And for the first time, people could have a study Bible that was built on something else. One thing moves to another thing. And I find that encouraging, because our work now can clear for the future. It can build for the future. As other people have set foundations, as other people have built, so we can build, so we can build uh, as well. I love the fact that God is wanting to use us now, but we haven't got to start from the very beginning. Other people have come before, and we can use what they have done as well. I hope these uh, 20 to 25 minutes or so will have encouraged each and every one of you to get into the history of Christianity in Wales. For the last 40 plus years, it's been a real joy for me to read about all the different characters and to get to know them. I often ask people, how many dead people do you really know? I know a number of Welsh dead people as I've read their uh, sermons, as I've read their diaries, and as I've been inspired by their lives. I continue to read Welsh church history as I continue to read all sorts of church history. I'm someone who was inspired by example. And I want to encourage you to take on maybe an aspect of Welsh church history. Get the books. It might be the Methodist revival you want to look at. It may be the age of the saints you want to look at. It may be how Christianity found its, uh, found its bearings again in the 20th century. All these things I've been unable to cover uh, today. But I want to encourage you to do something, to study. Don't just go by what other people say, but read it for yourself. It's given me lots of hope over the years. So much encouragement as I've seen others going through some of my dark times and also going through some of my great times. May God bless you all in Wales. I hope to be over uh, sometime. Who knows when, but I'm looking forward to it. God bless.